أكبر الله أكبر Assalamu alaikum and welcome to the Islamic Center at New York University podcast coming to you straight from the heart of New York City. We're building an amazing Muslim community here at ICNYU where everyone is welcomed and respected no matter where you're from or where you're at. This is the place to be. So open your ears and your heart and come along with us on another life-changing journey. Bismillah. All right, bismillahi walhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah. Assalamu alaikum everyone. Those who are joining, if you guys could, you know, join us. <laughs> Inshallah. So today's topic is about self-compassion and showing the attribute of mercy with ourselves. And so this is a very dear topic to me on a personal level, but also professionally. Um, early on when I you know, at the age of 18, 19, I started like asking these questions of how do I navigate my relationship with myself in a way that is in line with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in a way that doesn't make me arrogant, that doesn't make me, um, you know, self-obsessed or doesn't fall outside of the aqidah, you know. And so those were certain questions that I had because I really wanted to understand the connection between my relationship with Allah and my relationship with myself and at that time I felt that was kind of a missing component um, in a lot of the teachings that I was receiving or you know the talks that I would go to I'd always feel confused about well what about like me right how do I navigate myself so when I would hear you know so for years you know we would hear the teaching of Allah is merciful be merciful to others and so I would start thinking, well, are we allowed to show the attribute of mercy to ourselves? And of course the answer is yes. But I didn't receive that answer till years later. And so, because you know, there's like this negative connotation around loving yourself, especially at that time. And so when I would go and ask about that, loving ourselves was always described in the context of accountability and taming our nafs, you know, and, and making sure that, you know, we hold ourselves accountable. But I felt that there had to be a more holistic way for me to know who I am, you know, and have a loving and fulfilling relationship with myself that contributes to my spiritual growth. And so that's really what I was seeking. And I remember specifically, you know, this is why I always teach you guys that sometimes you'll have a question or you'll, you'll ask something, but Allah that doesn't give you the answer until a specific time. Allah chooses the timing to unveil you from something you need to know. And you can you can attest to that in your own life, you know. Many times you'll embark on a journey, you'd want to know certain answers, but there's a specific time and place in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unveils you from what you need to know. And maybe had He shown it to you earlier, you would not be able to receive it, right? And so that was the question I had, you know, well, where does my relationship with myself fall into Islam and fall into my relationship with God? And the answer came to me, and you know, um, when I was one day in nature, and I used to go out for walks a lot. And I remember one time I was living in California at the time, and I had just started my doctorate program, and it was 2013. And I remember reflecting on the ocean, and I love to go by the ocean, and it just always reminded me of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. And I caught myself, of course, saying SubhanAllah. Whenever we'd see something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created, we remind, remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? And so, or when I just saw the sunset, it, it, it leaves me in awe of, if this is like a creation, it's so beautiful, then I can't imagine Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then it hit me one normal day. I used to go there for walks all the time. And then I, I, I remember saying the statement to myself of, well, wait, I'm his creation too. <laughs> And that was the moment I was like, well, just as, just as those, me reflecting on those creations leads me to think of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then me knowing myself and, and, you know, and having a relationship with myself should also lead me to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that was the day that answered the question of what does it mean to man arafa nafsahu arafa rabbahu, whoever knows himself knows Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That was a statement that falls in line with my questioning and why, it was, I, why I was so confused. How do I bridge these two relationships? What does it mean that if you know yourself, you know Allah? It's that I'm His creation too. And so 
as I reflect on myself, as I get to know myself, as I get to know my strengths, my challenges, my weaknesses, that my destination is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not myself. And that really answered a lot of questions for me at the time. You know, as, as a young adult trying to navigate my relationship with myself, it really made it all connected. If there's no conflict of me connecting with the sunset, with the ocean, with the full moon, right? The full moon, if you just look, look at it, you're just in awe. You're in awe. And this, it's not a coincidence that there's a hadith in which the Prophet ﷺ tells the companions on the day of a full moon, he says, he tells them, you will see, he tells them, you will see Allah as clearly as you see that full moon. And I, before, before I, I found out about this hadith, I used to, I just used to always gravitate towards the full moon. I remember I would sit for hours just looking at the full moon. And I think, wow, you know, I, if this full moon is so beautiful and leaves me in awe, I can't imagine meeting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so to hear then the Prophet وسلم, link the full moon, like seeing the full moon, we would see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just as clearly was really something that, you know, again reinforced this, this truth that Allah is teaching us that everything points to Him. And this is the essence of Tawheed, is that everything points to God and everything is connected. Imam al-Ghazali, rahimullah, when he talks about, you know, this, this worldview of Tawheed, which is what Islam is. It's the, it's the monotheistic worldview, right? And he says it, it consists of three relationships that are all connected, but all moving in the same direction. And he says, that is your relationship with Allah, that is your relationship with yourself, and that is your relationship with nature, universe, right, others. <coughs> and so he says these three relationships are connected, but they all move in the same direction, which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's where the journey started for me on a personal level as I was studying psychology. It was more, first, it was really about me trying to navigate myself. And then as I learned these tools that really helped me, then I was like, okay, well, I can sh let me share them with others because I saw the benefit of it in my own life. And then, of course, as I continued studying and then my training, and then I was like, of course, then I can implement it in actually working with others. But I want you to know that so you, you, you understand that when I t share with you about self-compassion, it's not something that I understand theoretically. It's something that I understand its importance on a personal level. I understand its absence and I understand its presence. And that's why I know how important it is in our lives. It's so important for us to experience what it means to show mercy to ourselves, to be compassionate with ourselves, to express the attribute of rahma with ourselves too. Because only then will you truly understand what it means to express it to others. So later on when I developed my sacred self-love course and I was breaking down what are the ingredients of self-love. Compassion, self-compassion is an ingredient of self-love. Love is the foundation and then within that are key ingredients. But today we're just going to talk about compassion. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves us. That is the foundation of everything He has, you know, given us, everything He has withheld, His rewards, and even Him placing consequences on certain actions. It's all rooted in His love. And from that love, you know, He also expresses rahmah to us. But that rahmah and mercy is rooted in His love for us. So then it's the same with us. Compassion is rooted in self-love, right? In love for us. In a sacred way. In a way that is also through that lens of Tawheed. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the destination, not my nafs. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is my Rabb, not me. I'm not the Rabb of myself. So what does that mean then? When we show compassion in a way that to ourselves, that while Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is our destination, while the eye of our heart is on Allah, what does that mean? It means that self-love and, and compassion is not in the app is not um, void of me also holding myself into account because when you love someone you want what is best for them so self-love and self-compassion is not is not about feeling good it's about doing what serves you 
you know and this is really what differentiates you know a lot of the material out there because you'll hear messages that are very enough centered when it comes to self-love you know but self-love is self-love self-care self-compassion isn't just you know spas and you know doing things that are fun or feels good or no sometimes actually self-love and self-compassion is doing something that's really hard and uncomfortable but because you know you need it sometimes you know every day you go and you take your heart to pray that's an act of self-love and that's an act of rahmah because you know you need it because <laughs> if you think about rahmah right what is rahmah if you think of rahmah comes from the word rahim right womb <laughs> And if you think of the womb, what is the womb? It's the place where the infant or the, the fetus gets everything it needs from the mother. Nutrition, right? And it's interesting because rahma itself, mercy, is centered around what do I need to thrive? When, when, when you are merciful towards somebody, you are giving them something they need. <laughs> if you think about it, right? Like, you know, you give, you give someone a hug, that's mercy. But you're giving them something they need, they needed that hug. You give someone a gift, that's mercy. You give someone a smile, that's mercy. So, mercy is rooted in addressing our needs. Not our wants, or just feeling good, but what we actually need as ruh, as souls, to thrive. So every time you go to pray, you're expressing the attribute of rahmah to yourself because you're giving yourself what you need. You know that you cannot be cut off from your source, just like an infant cannot be cut off from, the, from their parent. So you know you need that link. You know you need to keep that link strong. So even though you might not want to walk, go pray, you might not feel like going to pray, you take your heart to pray because you know you need it. That's an act of self-compassion. So I want us to have a very holistic sense of what self-compassion looks like because when we have a rigid understanding of something, we really you know, miss out on all the ways we are being compassionate with ourselves or all the opportunities we have to be compassionate with ourselves. So self-compassion is doing for yourself what you need, you know, even though you don't feel like it even though you might not want to. It's going beyond your nafs and giving your heart what it was created to need and what it was created to, to strive for. You know, it's like the same thing. I always, I always relate this and you guys have heard me, you know, um, relate a lot of the spiritual practices to like working out and fitness because I see it being applied more easily in that realm. Like it's the same thing. Someone might not want to go work out, but they take their heart there. You know, they take their body there. They take themselves there, right? So they, because they know they need it. They know that they might not want to, but when they walk away, they're going to feel better. You know, I remember, you know, um, when we had, uh, when my, we used to study with this, me and a group of girls used to study with a specific teacher and we had our halakha uh, for a long time. We had our, our study circle after Fajr. And so there were many times where, you know, we wanted to go back, to sleep after Fajr and not, you know, and, and oh man, like we'd, we'd call each other. We're like, we'd always say this one thing. No, because we, we say we have to go because we always are grateful that we went. And we always remember that. So even though the comfort of our beds was so, was so comf, you know, nobody wants to leave that, especially in the winter, especially to get in your car and drive to the masjid during Fajr time, right? But when we would leave, we would say, no, alhamdulillah, we came. We needed this. It's the same thing with anything. That was an act of rahmah. That was an act of sacred self-love. You know, giving yourself, treating yourself. No, I'm taking you where you need. Like a parent. You know, a child can be very nafs-centered. <laughs> no, no, no. Doesn't even see beyond the because the nafs has a limited lens, right? It only sees it only sees, you know, to the extent of its wants, to the extent of its comforts, to the extent of what feels good. But the parent sees beyond that and says, right? You agree? <laughs> he heard nafs and he's like, are you talking about me? <laughs> um, so yeah, so you know, uh, subhanAllah, when you see children, right? They, they do remind you of how we are with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
you know a child especially when you look when you look at like development from a psychological lens children around this age you know they're they're just um they are driven by what feels good right who's you're you're the mom right isn't that true yeah. right you might they they might be excited about seeing something wow that's so pretty but it might be a fire <laughs> and the parent is like you know they think the flames are so pretty and the parents taking them away and so this is the same thing that's rahma when the mother goes and takes the child away from something harmful don't we say that's rahma that's mercy that's love and it's the same thing with allah subhanahu wa ta'ala many times people will ask the question you know how is it Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves us but we but we're tested and we're in so much pain and it's the same thing mother mother and child the child might want something the mother says no the child is in a lot of pain it hurts takes the toy away consequence in their mind it's so painful but for them for the parent they see much more they see beyond that but again back to the nafs the nafs has a very limited view and it will only see to the extent of when it feels good or how it can feel good, how it can feel comfortable. So our goal is to not be led from that nafs, not be led from that part of us, and to access this greater tool that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us that can see beyond what the nafs sees. That no, we need to go there because this is good for us. No, no to the nafs, <laughs> period. <laughs> Right? And this is what we do in Ramadan. Ramadan is coming up. That's, that's what we do. We say no to the nafs. And what do people say by the end of Ramadan? I don't want Ramadan to end. Many people will cry so much because Ramadan is ending. They feel like they're saying goodbye to something that aligned them. Something that created harmony for them. And it's because they experience the beauty of not being led from the nafs and accessing this greater tool that strives for that that seeks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you know and and strives to embody these qualities of love and rahmah and so that's the first thing is to remember that mercy self mercy self compassion self love in a sacred way is prioritizing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not making yourself the destination, not making your nafs the destination. Secondly, it's about taking yourself to what you need, even though it doesn't feel good. Even though it might not be what you want, and even though it might be uncomfortable. Thirdly, it's accepting what you learn about yourself without being harsh. Many people confuse acceptance with complacency, right? That if I accept something about myself, that means I'm not going to change it. Or, or with passiveness, that they, they, they equate acceptance, self-acceptance, as I'm going to be passive, I'm not going to change, I'm not going to grow. But the reality is, is that acceptance is a key ingredient of self-compassion. Because you cannot change what you do not accept about yourself. And the opposite of acceptance is rejection. Rejection is not a, rahma, is not a quality of rahmah, if you think about it. When you reject someone, you push, push them away or even deny their existence, that's not a quality of mercy. So when we, when we learn things about ourselves that maybe don't match this ideal self that we're trying to present, what do we do with it? Do we reject it? Do we deny it? Do we hate ourselves? Are we harsh? Do we make interpretations now about Allah subhanahu, about how Allah views us? Do we project onto Allah what we feel about ourselves? Maybe if you hate yourself through that, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala must hate you. That's the kind of the dialogue. So acceptance is when you can welcome the reality that is you and all that exists within you. You know, the, that expression, the good, the bad, the ugly, right? You know, just, just for the sake of like, understanding that there's some things that people don't want to look at. They perceive it as ugly. They perceive it as not good. They perceive it as something they should hate. But if you treat aspects of yourself that way, you never have the opportunity to actually learn from them. You, have no, you don't have the opportunity to change something you don't even like. But instead, shame comes up because you're rejecting yourself. And so, the, a key aspect of compassion is being able to welcome all that you learn about yourself. 
with the intention that anything I learn that is not in line with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as long as I'm alive, Allah has given me the opportunity to change it. Right? And so, but I'm not going to hate myself to grow. Because nothing can grow in the presence of hate. And this is something that you, we really need to understand. And why self-compassion is so crucial. Because if you hate yourself while you're trying to change something, it's going to hinder your ability to, to actually change that thing. Because it creates a very hostile environment within you. It does not create an environment within you that is full of rahmah, that is full of love, that's gonna give you the energy to move forward. It's gonna make you exhausted, mentally and emotionally. Because who are you with 24 seven? Yourself. And I want you to picture this, like if you go on a journey, let's say you, you plan a trip and you know, the person who decides to accompany you is somebody you don't like. You know, somebody you actually don't like at all. <laughs> or you don't like aspects of them. But it impacts your trip. <laughs> let's say you hate that person. Like, you know, I mean, I hope you don't, but you know, let's say like you just can't stand that person at all. Can't stand them in your presence and you're always judging them. Oh my gosh, here she goes again. Look what she did. Look what she said. You know, look at how she reacted or look at, you know, whatever it is, right? And let's say you keep, you, you, you just, you know, can't stand this journey now because you're with this person that you don't like. Now that's a journey, a journey ends, it's temporary. But you know who you're with for a lot longer? <laughs> Yourself. You're with yourself every second, every minute, every day, and many people don't like themselves. Many people hate themselves. So what, do you, what does a person usually do when they don't like someone they're on a journey with, right? Try to like minimize any, like minimize as much <laughs> communication as possible. Or maybe try to go in different directions. Okay, you know what, I'm gonna spend time over here. Maybe, you know, let's take a break, right? You know, you're gonna try to, you're gonna try to step away. But you can't step away from yourself. And this is why a lot of times when people wanna change, you know, they might be doing, they might initially be doing the right things towards the ch their change that they need to, but because they're coming from a place of so much self-loathing, so much absence of compassion, they end up self-sabotaging again and again and again because it's exhausting they're with this person day in day out it gets tiring and then here you are trying to do good for this person that you you don't like and it's you so you have to be your friend your own friend that's what really self-compassion is it's being your own friend and treating yourself like you would treat a friend that you love So many times, you know, when I work with clients on self-compassion, especially in certain situations, I'll always ask, well, how would you respond to somebody you love who comes to you with a struggle? And most of the time, they would never say half the things that they said to themselves. Right? This is this program, well, I'm supposed to love them, that's what love is. Well, you're his creation too, you're Allah's creation too. And just like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to be loving, and Allah is loving, Allah is al-wadud. He wants us to be loving with his creation, but why? Because he loves his creation. He loves you. So why would he want you to be unkind to yourself? He doesn't, that's displeasing to Allah. How many of us think of it that way? That that, that actually is displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you call yourself a bad name, even in a joke, by the way, you know, that catches up to you. If you keep making jokes at your own expense, your body feels the score of that. And I want you to, you know, if you're someone who is accustomed to, you know, throwing yourself under the bus all the time and making jokes at your expense and putting yourself down in the name of a joke, right? I want you to like, if you do that, I want you to see how your body feels in those moments. Most often your body doesn't feel too good. If you're connected to yourself, you're gonna feel like, what is that? What, what didn't feel too good? But oftentimes people are doing that as a protective mechanism that they don't even notice but it takes a toll. So even the way we joke about ourselves or others, I really don't believe in, in 
calling people names even in the name of a joke, you know, I think, or or putting people down in the name of a joke. I really, I really don't like don't like that at all because I think it, I think it has negative consequences even if everyone's laughing. <laughs> And this is why the Prophet ﷺ never joked at the expense of putting somebody down. You know, so how you speak to yourself matters. How you treat yourself matters. How honest you are with yourself matters. And that's also a form of self-compassion. You know, when you really love someone and you have mercy towards them, you want to be honest with them. And if they come to you and they say, well, what do you think I should do? Can you give me feedback about the situation? And you sugarcoat it just to make them feel good. That's not compassionate. That's actually not, not, not an ingredient of love and rahma. Because truth liberates people. Truth allows people to have guidance. Truth is what allows people, you know, the truth will set you free, they say, right? Truth lights the way. So when someone actually comes to you and they want you, you know, this is a good sign of friendship. You know, it's like, it's like, okay, let me ask you guys a question. If you have a friend, maybe more the, the ladies will, <laughs> will attest to, but like if you have a friend and you, and let's say you are going out and you, you did not look good at all, right? Let's say like you had something on your face, I don't know, something, and your friend didn't tell you. And the whole time you guys went out and she let you look like that, wouldn't you be annoyed? Why didn't you tell me? Because why? Why would you be annoyed? By being honest. By being honest, right? And then if later on she said, and let's say you walked through, you know, New York City and s saw so many people, and not once did she tell you it's something between your teeth or, you know, that. Even even your hijab, let's say your, your whole, your half your head is showing, right? And you wear hijab and she's like, oh, I didn't know that you wanted me to tell you. You'd be like, you're my friend, you know? If you love me and you have mercy towards me, you tell me the truth. <laughs> Same thing with ourselves. Can you be honest with yourself? Can you tell yourself the truth about the reality of the situation? Okay, this is what I'm good at. These are my strengths, but you know what? I need to improve in this. You know, I need to get this part together in my life. And that's okay. That's mercy towards yourself. Because we don't want to be on opposite extreme of anything. We don't want to be all the way on the end where, you know, now self-compassion, self-love is I don't even look at my challenges and weaknesses. No. Because that will only make your ego so big and that's going to create so many different harms. And you don't want to be on the other end too, where you are constantly self-critical, constantly, you know, holding yourself into account without any rahma, without any love, without any kindness towards yourself. That also makes your ego big. <laughs> you know why? Because insecurity and lack of self-compassion actually promotes our egos. <clears throat> when people, people, the ego comes up to preserve our image, the ego comes up so we can feel secure. That's what the ego is programmed to do. So whenever it senses a little bit of insecurity, it comes up to the surface. And so the more we work on our insecurities, the more we accept ourselves for who we are while actively working on ourselves, the more we grow from a place of love, the ego has less reason to keep coming up to the surface. We can be more vulnerable, we can be more open, and we can actually be more accepting of other people. I don't know if I, I gave this example before, but just in case, you know, um, I didn't. When I teach self-love, there's a specific concept I teach to help people understand how the ego comes up, especially in community environments, in spaces, and how important it is to love ourselves. And so part of this work of loving yourself and having compassion towards yourself is that you see your own light. You see the beauty that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put within you already, right? Your personality, everybody, everybody's personality is different. It, that in itself is, is, is a blessing and a gift. Your personality might have different strengths, her personality might have different strengths, and that's what makes us all unique and beautiful, right? There's, it's not a coincidence that we all have our own unique fingerprint. 
no nobody has the same this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala telling you that you, you like each of us are are created uniquely so how can we not appreciate that actually that makes your that makes that puts a sense of security in within yourself that wow Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took the time to create each of us so uniquely with our own act with our own attributes with our own strengths with our own weaknesses even but when you don't see when all you see is your um insecurities but you don't see your own light you don't see your own blessings that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you guess what happens when you see somebody else's you won't like it okay. and i'll give you an example if somebody and this is what i was referring to earlier this is this is the way that i kind of try to portray it is that it's like being in a room that's dark did i say this before anyone hear this before? okay it's like being in a room that is really dark. If you're in a room with absolutely no light and it's complete darkness and somebody comes in and turns on the light, what do people usually do? If you're in a room, no light at all, complete pitch black, and somebody comes in and turns on the light, what's the first thing that you do? Huh? You cover your eyes or you squint, right? You can't look because there was no light in the room at all. What if you had a little lamp and then somebody came in and just turned on more light? Can you look? Yeah, you can. They just brought their own light or they added on to the light. Now you can look. So this helped me understand how important it is that we see our own light because you know especially in my work I found that the people who have the hardest time with welcoming other people's light and this is what helped me like develop the like think of it this way because when I work with people who like for example easily get jealous or you know have a hard time welcoming other people's strengths a lot of times it's dark they don't see there's no light not that there's no light inside, you know, it's a dark room. Let's just, you know, back to the example. They don't have any light on. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given everybody their share of beauty, their share of light, their share of strengths. You just have to look and you have to accept and you have to embrace it and you have to show shukr for it. Gratitude. Because it's not gratitude when you, when you ignore a gift. It's not. You know, growing up or many of you maybe, you know, we, we as you know especially people who grew up like in different cultures you know that that promoted this concept of humility that is like put minimizing your struggles <laughs> minimizing your gifts a lot of us are programmed say alhamdulillah 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 right you know you know someone compliments something oh yeah alhamdulillah you know or or you minimize it oh this it's nothing i used to do that you know as i always tell you guys this is a personal journey for me first so i i used to do that Someone compliments me, oh my God, it used to make me so uncomfortable. I have to minimize it right away. And then I realize, but I'm literally saying, no, I don't have something that Allah gave me. But I said, Alhamdulillah. How is that gratitude? Right? That's not gratitude. And I remember my teacher one time saying, when he taught me this hadith, he said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves to see the effects of his blessings upon his servant. So here I was, you know, a young adult minimizing, <laughs> minimizing, minimizing, and then hearing this hadith, I'm like, wow, so, because what is that minimizing? Is we learn that if we embrace our strengths, that it's arrogance. That's what it was, right? It's like, I'm gonna be arrogant or I'm gonna look arrogant, you know, I'm not gonna appear humble, but I realize that's not humility either. Me minimizing what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given me is not humility. And it doesn't matter how humble you we, we try to appear, right? It doesn't matter. Meaning that when someone compliments us or when someone notices our strengths, we should really ask ourselves, are we really being humble in that moment or trying to present humbleness? Because if you look at Abu Bakr, who, how did he respond to someone complimenting him? 
May Allah make me better than what you think of me and forgive me for what you do not know about me. That's balance. But I love that part of may Allah make me better than what you think of me. Oh, you think, okay, may Allah make me better than that. <laughs> you know, meaning like I want more because he sees who? The giver. That's humility. But also, may he forgive me for what you do not know about me. Because a human being doesn't see everything. Right? And, and what people see about us is only the a reflection of what are, are the flaws that Allah has concealed as well, right? So it's about balance. So when we learn these concepts, we're like, no, I'm not, I'm not minimizing Allah's gifts. You know, I'm not minimizing what he has given me. And then also at the same time, you know, when he gives us something and you ignore it and you don't look at it and you don't want to open, you know, like reflect upon it and see how it can be utilized, that's not gratitude either. Because if you give a gift to somebody and they don't even open it, you're going to be like, did they really, did they really like it? They really appreciate it? They might have said thank you to you, but it doesn't matter if you still see it unwrapped in the corner of their room. So there are so many ways in which we can practice compassion with ourselves that is rooted in our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where the eye of our heart is on Allah you know I I get I see a strength about myself Ya Allah help me use it thank you first of all thank you thank you for this this blessing or thank you for you know someone compliments you even personality traits oh you're you're so easy to talk to or you're so you know thanks for being there for me gratitude alhamdulillah thank you Allah for you know, making me a person that's there for people or thank you Allah for giving me the, that quality that is lovable to somebody else because these are gifts and these are blessings you know if like you know when you're given the the um, sorry the way to put buttercup in anything you're given blessings and anything you're given is to use it for good <laughs> so like if you want buttercup in your money and your wealth give a lot of charity you'll find a lot of buttercup in your wealth if you want baraka in your health, this is why subhanAllah we pray the rakatain duha, right? It's not a coincidence that we pray those two rakahs that and the, 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 the Prophet وسلم, says it's a charity. You know, it's a charity for the joints that we are given. So he even named the number, I believe it's uh, in the hadith, um, any 360, 360 or 360 something. But joints, the, it was in the hadith 1400 years ago that the Rasulullah said that you have this amount of joints and that rak, uh, the rakatin, the two rakahs we pray for Salat al duha that's between uh, after sunrise and before duha, right? Is a charity, a sadaqa for your joints. You know, if just one of your joints is harmed, like even just, here's a joint, right? This is a joint. If just this one, let's say, tip of your finger, it'll affect your whole hand. It'll affect your ability to use this hand. And then it will affect the rest of your body because you have to now adjust around this little, this little joint being impacted. So those two rakahs are our way of showing shukr, gratitude, for the joints of our body. Another way that you can, that, uh, the Prophet Wasallam also uh, gave us as an example of showing uh, giving sadaqah for our joints is picking something up that is harmful from the road. So think about this. What, what do you have to do when you pick up something harmful from the road? You have to use your joints, right? So what is, what is that? You're using what Allah has given you for good and having these joints is such a great blessing. It allows you to move. It allows you to do so many things. So we're taught in Islam that anything we are given, we should use it for good even your joints, even if it's something like picking up something harmful from the road. Isn't that amazing? Your knowledge, how do you use that? Does it benefit your life? Are you trying to actively apply that knowledge? Because that's the thing that we want. We don't just want to have. No, we want to have barakah. A lot of people have time. Very few people have barakah in their time. You want barakah in your time? It's not just about having time. There's somebody who can have less time and someone can have more time and this person has barakah in their time. Does that make sense? So they do more in those few hours than maybe somebody who has a lot of time. We want barakah. We want blessings in what we do. 
So anytime Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you something internally or externally, how can I use that for his sake? How can I use that for good? God gives me money. How much of my money? Am, this is why we have zakat, right? Giving out a portion of our wealth every year to charity. But even outside of that, you know, you, 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 we should want to give. My teacher used to always say that, um, you know, when you, when you stop giving charity, he says you will notice that your money is going to go out anyway, but to things that are like frivolous. You know, like, he, he's like, he gave examples like, you know, you'll find like, all of a sudden you have to go to the dentist, your car breaks down, you know, all these things that you start paying for that you, you didn't maybe want to give in charity because you were like, I want to hold on to it. Now you find yourself giving, giving it anyway to things that don't benefit you. But subhanAllah, we know that when you give charity, Allah returns it, right? This is a, a teaching in our, in, in our faith. And I'm 100% I'm sure that anyone who has given charity has seen this truth. You know, that when you give, Allah returns it in His own way. <laughs> you find somebody giving you, or you find you gaining something, it's never lost. When you try to benefit somebody else for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You find more barakah in your wealth. You find, you feel, even though maybe you might not even be making as much, you feel like you have a lot. <laughs> and these, these are true experiences that people have when there's barakah. A person could be making so much money and not have barakah in their, in their wealth and always feel like they're, they're void, they're, they need to make more. And somebody could be making a lot less and feel like, uh, like I, I have so much. <laughs> so this is, you know, even with our knowledge, even with our minds, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given this, this amazing tool, this, this phenomenal machine that's always working, it's always helping us, you know, gather information, understand and process. Are we using it for good or are we letting it absorb all the things that do not benefit us? I can tell you that the people, you know, who I've seen in their old age, who, who their intellect is just so sharp, <laughs> are people who spent their life using this for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Learning, benefit, you know, trying to engage in, in you know, being students, constantly learning, constantly wanting to grow. You know, constantly connecting with the Quran. <laughs> if you if you find yourself not memorize, not like remembering things well, reignite your relationship with memorizing the Quran. Okay, I, I have memory. I have a tool of memory. Let me use it for for Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, and watch how your memory will improve. So. It's the same thing with anything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. It's that, how can I use it for good? And that's my way to show gratitude for what Allah has given me. You know, sometimes, and I'll end with this and I'll take questions. Sometimes, we have this personality trait or like an attribute of ourselves that's good, right? And that, it, you know, people benefit from, okay? Like, let's say you're very compassionate or you're very loving. Or, and by the way, I just want to correct something. Just doesn't mean that, you know, the example of the dark room, it doesn't mean that somebody who struggles with self-compassion can't love others or be compassionate. It just, it's limited, right? You know, and, and there are a lot of people who maybe don't know how to be compassionate to themselves and still welcome people's light and welcome, you know what I mean? So it's not black and white. Everybody's different. Just wanted to clarify that. But um, now I lost, now I lost track of the other thing I was going to say. Does anyone remember what I was going to say before? Oh God. Um, yes, so when, when sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give us attributes about ourselves that we give, right? Like let's say you're, you're, you're a giver. Let's just say you're a giver. You have this capacity to give love and to hold space for people and to always show up and to always be there, right? And then you feel like it's not reciprocated or you feel like it's taken for granted. Oftentimes, what do people do when they're hurt after they've given so much, after they've used what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given them to give others? What happens to people? They shut down. They shut down. They retreat. They retreat. They say, I'm no longer giving you this. When 
the rumor was uh, spread about Aisha radiallahu anha. Her father, Abu Bakr, had, had, was giving charity to, to a man at the time who he found out later <laughs> was part of that rumor, right? He was responsible or he played a role somehow in that rumor. And first thing is he didn't want to give him charity anymore. But he was advised, right, that to give because this is from Allah. <laughs> We forget that it's the same with our attributes. You know when you like you say, okay, you know what, I'm not giving any more of myself. But you know what? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who gave you that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who gave you that blessing. It's like saying like, you know, let's say you give charity and then that person doesn't thank you. Do you stop giving charity? No. Because you know Allah gave you that money. Allah gave you that wealth. So you want to continue to give. Sometimes we get really bad experiences make us not want to give anybody else. And I'm not talking about those specific people that hurt us. I'm just talking about general. People will say, I'm not giving any more of myself to anyone. And they stop and they withhold the good that they have. But they're withholding Allah's blessing. And it's important to think of it that way too with your attributes. That you are the one who's actually, I know, I know, of course, the people who get that quality from you benefit, but you're the one who benefits the most for having that quality. If you're a giver and you don't feel like everyone else is a giver in your life and you get hurt by that, remember that Allah made you a giver. And guess what? He has named himself the best of givers, right? The best of like, yeah, Al-Wahhab, right? The one who gives the best gifts, right? The best of givers. So if you have a quality that, that is an attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and yes, it might not be, maybe somebody else didn't appreciate it, somebody else did not receive it well, somebody else did not reciprocate, don't let that stop you from giving it back out. Because you are the one who's blessed to have that attribute. So yeah, it, it, of course we're human and it might hurt, but remember, you know what? Alhamdulillah that I even have this attribute, that I even have this ability to give, that I even have this ability to listen, that I have this ability to be kind, ability to help. There are people who don't have that capacity. There are people who don't have the capacity to hold space or to be kind or to give or to be generous, even charity. You might go like, just like Abu Bakr, <laughs> the person you give charity. I mean, think of how painful this was. To find out that the person you've been given, giving charity to was responsible for this horrible rumor about your daughter. He's human, right? <laughs> but you remember, you know what? I want barakah in what I have. It's not about the people. I'm just grateful that I have this quality. Ya Allah, please don't take it away from me. Same thing with Iman, faith. You know, when you have Iman and you feel that beauty of, of Iman and closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, thank Him for it. Because <laughs> it's a blessing. And so when you have it, don't take it for granted. When you find something beautiful about yourself and you, you feel like it's a strength, thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't take it for granted and look for ways to use it. And do not let people have that much power over you that they keep you from using the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because you're the one who gets impacted. You know, when you, when you withhold something that's a part of you, that you naturally do, that's part of who you are, and you start withholding, you actually feel worse because you're giving so much power to the people outside of you. But it's there. You're just now preventing yourself from being who you are because some people didn't, re didn't respond well to it. So you're punishing yourself. <laughs> and in the end, you become more miserable. So anything we have internally and externally is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and a part of self-compassion is that you see His rahmah towards you and you feel His rahmah towards you and it ignites within you this need to want to so, show shukr, show gratitude. Just like the Prophet them, who would get up and pray long nights and when his wife, you know, Aisha radiallahu anha asked him about you know why he's praying so long especially this is the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he most beloved to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guaranteed jannah why why is he standing so long in prayer and he said shouldn't i be a grateful servant 
right? Shouldn't sh like he is now getting up to pray out of shukr, <laughs> out of gratitude. This is a real deep connection to how lucky he is, right? And how grateful he is and how he is so immensely aware of Allah's rahma to him. And it changes, rahma changes the way you interact with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you think of all the ways that Allah has been merciful to you. And that's a great way for you to start. Really, if you, there's a guided meditation I do where I tell my students to just start reflecting on all the ways that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has been merciful to you. And you could put your hand on your heart and just start reflecting throughout your life, the little moments, the big moments. You could start with the most basic, the obvious thing. Allah has given me sight. Allah has given me faith and iman and deen, a prescription, a way of life. And just to constantly think of all the ways that He has been merciful to you. All the ways that He has shown that love and mercy. Sometimes we don't see it because we don't take the time to reflect upon it. We don't take the time to really connect to how vast His mercy is to us on a daily basis. And once you feel that, once you really immensely feel how merciful Allah is to you, it ignites a mercy towards yourself and to others. It, it gives you an energy and the capacity to be merciful to others. And think about it, this is why the Prophet ﷺ had this amazing capacity to be so merciful towards people. <laughs> because of how deep his connection was to the most merciful. So that's the difference between, you know, self-compassion through an Islamic lens and any other lens is that the source of our mercy comes from Allah, who has an infinite supply of what you are seeking. The source of our love comes from Al-Wadud, the most loving and who has an infinite supply of what you are seeking. So I'll stop here and I think we have like three minutes before Imam Khalid uh, comes in for the talk. So I'll take any questions inshallah. Yeah, I think everybody, um, I first I would recommend that everyone just develop a consistent relationship with the Quran because the surah that you might find speaks to mercy for you might be different than the surahs that I find speak to mercy for me. And this is why this heart has to have a consistent connection with the Quran. Because you could read, we could both be reading the same surah and you could be like, wow, look at this verse. That's Allah's mercy. And I could be talk, and I could look at a different verse and be like, "Wow, that's Allah's mercy," you know. But uh, for me, it's Surah Taha, you know, um, where Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala talks about His love, uh, you know, and He says to Musa, "Wa alqaytu alayka mahabbatan minni, wa li tusna alayni." I have bestowed upon you love from me, so that you may be raised or molded under my eye. I love that that verse. Uh, Surah Al Duha is really beautiful too. That Allah has not abandoned you, nor has He forsaken you. Um, uh, I mean, Allah has not forsaken you, nor does He like uh, reject you or hate you. That's a beautiful, beautiful uh, surah in the Quran as well. There's so many, really. But the thing is, is that every time you go to the Quran, you're going to find another one. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has written, this is a, an ayah in the Quran, He has written upon Himself rahmah. Right? Meaning, like, it's so hard to describe this, right? Like, it's one thing, right, for a supervisor come in and say I am merciful right he's human he might lie <laughs> he might not be he might not actually is human he's 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 faulty right he's gonna be imperfect but it's another thing for your creator to say that he has that's that's been written upon himself that that's something right it's a promise <laughs> or his mercy encompasses all things and so uh, or uh, the this is um, not from the Quran, it's a hadith, but that uh, I'm paraphrasing, but that Allah's mercy is greater to us than a mother to her child. So many things. If you look at our, if you look at you know Islam and, and the Quran and hadith, it's rooted in love and mercy. Even the things that seem like it's a consequence, it's to protect you. <laughs> love and mercy. Yeah.
Um, the point that you made about being awkward when it comes to accepting compliments mm -hmm. really resonated with me because I'm yeah. the same exact way. Um, so how do you approach that or how do you respond when you get a compliment? It's like, mm -hmm. what is the balance between being mm -hmm. humble and being awkward about it and being boastful and arrogant yeah. about it? I mean, I think it's okay. There's always going to be a little discomfort, you know, I think especially if it's something like you had to work on, right? Um, but I think it's about prioritizing Allah in those moments. So for me, like, I, I always like to say Alhamdulillah before I even say thank you to the person because I think it just reminds me to first thank Allah, you know, and um, but I but also you, you, you we're human, like thank the person, say thank you. That that's very kind of them, right? To notice beauty in, in, in you and, and so there's this there's you know, when people see beauty in us, um, that's from Allah too, you know, but always we have to appreciate also the good. That's a form of good that came your way. Um, and just have that balance, you know, that in that moment it's not about how you're perceived and yeah, you know what, you might you might actually be perceived arrogant sometimes when you when you're not. You know, by you saying alhamdulillah, thank you, someone who who was like, oh, okay, like, you know, like it might, it might happen, but it just, the work is about prioritizing Allah so that your concern is not so much the people and their reactions. And I think, and you know, that's the most powerful thing about Islam, right? Is that, I mean, there's so many powerful things, but one of the most powerful, you know, qualities that it cultivates within all of us is that it frees us to a greater level from the opinions of people, from you know, their judgment of us. The more you do this work of having taqwa and prioritizing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the less you're gonna be thinking about how people are perceiving you. And so many people spend so much energy in that direction. I wonder what she, they're gonna think about this. I wonder, did they, did they think I'm arrogant? I wonder if they thought this. It's a lot and it's more than ever now. I don't know if it's because of like, our immense connect, you know, connectedness on social media. I don't know what's like contributing, but I even, I even feel it's so different than like our parents' generation. <laughs> you know, the way that it may be in different ways, but I think it's becoming more minute, like little things. Whereas I feel like when I work with older people or people from our parents' generation, they're able to let go a little bit more of like these little, little, um, I don't know like little moments where they're worried about how someone perceives them, you know? So it's different, but I don't know, maybe I'll pinpoint it a little bit better, but it's something that I've been reflecting on. I'm like, I'm wondering why it's it's becoming more intense lately. But yeah, I think just prioritizing Allah and, and, and remembering Him when someone sees something beautiful about you, that that's from Allah too, you know, and that, that helps you feel, you know, humility. Yes. Um, so I'm really glad that you touched upon like, being a giver is not something that we feel bad about or when, when it's not being reciprocated and really it increases our heart in general. But my question is, like, I'm sure you're aware too, like the recent wave in media about setting boundaries and yeah. how that is a form of self-love. Yeah. But at the same time, like, yeah I think that's gonna have to be a whole different topic because I can't I can't I, also the context of everything is different I really I'm very cautious when I talk about boundaries I don't know if you guys notice but like I'm a, a bit cautious because I feel that when I get questions about boundaries, especially with parents, or I have to know the specific situation. And the reason for that is because online, people are getting blanketed statements, you know, general statements that could be very harmful when they apply into their own life. Boundaries is not a one package fits all, right? It's not, it, it has to be taken context by context with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as the priority and what is best for for you know my relationship with Allah even in that situation you know and and it can't be ego centered it can't be nafs centered you know a lot of times the way boundaries are talked about it's to make the ego feel good oh that person bothered you cut them off that person triggered you cut them off it's like okay well you know what all you're doing is you're coddling your nafs you're coddling your ego so you actually did not create any opportunity of growth because if you cut off every single person that makes you uncomfortable or every single person that maybe didn't like appreciate you in that moment 
first of all, we, we deprive people of the opportunity of, of changing as well. Like if you cut them off and you never communicate, for example, you know, you never communicate your needs or you never give an opportunity where you can have a discussion, that person might actually not know. And so boundaries, we have to stop talking about boundaries, especially this is why I'm like a bit critical of like all of these, you know, um, uh, what? Social media. Yeah, like just the, the movement now where people are giving advice about very serious things. And a lot of times it lacks clinical training. It lacks, you know, um, it just having some piece of knowledge and regurgitating it out there. And so it's really difficult. But it's an important topic. I'll try to cover it, inshallah, in the coming uh, weeks. Okay. All right. We'll, s we'll stop here then, inshallah. Jazakum Allah khair. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi We hope you enjoyed our podcast. If you're inspired by the work that we're doing at the IC and want to help keep it going, subscribe to our podcasts, follow us on social media, donate to help support us at icnyu.org, and most importantly, keep us in your continued du'as. Until next time, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum.